<clears throat> so first I want to thank Agostino for setting up this talk and for the opportunity to speak here at Data Science. Uh, it's my first visit to the Data Science group, but I've been to Columbia many times and always enjoyed interacting here. I see many old friends uh, from, my, from my previous visits, and I see many of you when you visit Stanford, so thank you. Uh, I decided um, in conference with Agostino to give a kind of general overview talk of what's happening in the world of reforming uh, benchmarks like LIBOR. Uh, and my objective is not to do mathematical modeling this afternoon, uh, but I will try to hint where the interesting modeling or data issues are. And then those of you who are thinking about research topics in this area, I think I'll give you enough clues uh, to guess where the, where the most interesting bodies are buried. <clears throat> the topic is very, very important. I'm going to, you know, I'll keep saying uh, how significant I believe this topic is for the well-functioning of the financial system and to some extent for financial stability. Um, I'm going to, you'll see as we go through this, that I'm going to be drawing on many different lines of inquiry some of which are my own in collaboration with many people. Let me just name them. Piotr Dvorak, who's a PhD student at Stanford. David Skye from the New York Fed. Now moved, I think, to Texas. Jeremy Stein, a former, when we worked together on this, he was a governor of the Federal Reserve System. He's now at Harvard University. James Vickery from the New York Fed. Hao Shang Ju from MIT. And a large group of people called the Market Participants Group for Reference Rate Reform, which is a group that was put together by the Financial Stability Board to look at at, uh, reforming reference rate benchmarks like LIBOR and Juribor. And uh, they needed somebody neutral to chair this group, so I was the chair. Neutral meaning I'm neither a consumer of bank products nor a producer of bank products, I'm just an academic. And we collected, we worked very hard for a year and made a lot of recommendations based on a lot of data, some of which you'll see today, about what to do with the problems that we've seen in uh, LIBOR. Now, some of what I'll say applies to any important financial benchmark. And here's some examples. The top row is the interbank offered rates, which I'll focus on. Then there are shorter term interest rates like Sonia or Ionia. There are foreign exchange fixings. There are metals, commodities, other than metals, like oil, natural gas, iron ore, even pharmaceuticals. All of these have benchmarks. And incidentally, other than these official uh, short-term rates in the second line, all of these have been manipulated, meaning someone was dishonestly reporting uh, or dishonestly producing transactions used to produce these benchmarks with very consequential effects. Just to give you an idea of how consequential, the fines that have been assessed on banks for misreporting are now on the order of about $10 billion US. There are going to be, I predict, and I'm not involved as an expert on this, I've purposefully stayed away from doing expert witness work on this, there are going to be even larger, I predict, litigation penalties for the misreporting that was done. Why? Well, because when misreporting occurred, some of these benchmarks suggested prices that were not realistic. People traded at those prices, and now many of those people feel entitled, perhaps with good reason, that they are entitled to recover um, based on the price that they paid versus what it would have been had the manipulation not occurred. Many of these issues are, have been addressed. Some of them have not. And I'm going to try to take you through with a focus on interest rates. Um, I think I, I won't talk too much about why these manipulations occurred, but they had a lot, they had a lot to do with, let me go back, uh, they had a lot to do with individuals within banks that were trying to profit um, on positions that they had, like in the derivatives market, that were settled based on these benchmarks. Settled meaning how much you get on an option, a swap, a futures contract, a forward, or whatever, depends on some underlying benchmark like oil, LIBOR, foreign exchange, and so on. And if, uh, if somebody at a bank has a large position on that's linked to LIBOR, then that individual may wish LIBOR to be a higher number that day. That individual would call the bank submitting person and say, would you mind reporting a higher than realistic number today in order to get my swap position uh, in the money? 
and for some reason the people reporting actually agreed to do that. That was somewhat surprising to me. The other kind of manipulation was during the financial crisis, some banks, when reporting the interest rates at which they borrowed money, uh, were concerned that the marketplace would be worried that if they reported a high borrowing rate, that investors might infer that the bank was in trouble. If the bank were viewed to be in trouble, then they would have more costly financing and possibly even uh, ha suffer from financial instability or severe financial distress. Understandably, they didn't want that to happen, but incorrectly, they lied in order to prevent that information from getting to the market. <clears throat> but that, by the way, was the far bigger effect on LIBOR than the misreporting for purposes of profiting on derivatives positions. Those latter greedy swap trading effects were uh, on the order of a basis point or two. The bigger effects of banks not wishing to disclose their true credit quality was more on the order of 30 basis points for months at a time. And there are various estimates, and I'm sure that the litigation will get deeply into how, how big uh, the distortions were for how long. Now, why, why do we care from the viewpoint of other than some people are going to lose and some people are going to win if you get the wrong number? One of the reasons we care, well, all, three reasons for caring are on this slide. The first one is the one that I mentioned. You have derivatives or other financial products like mortgages, floating rate notes, some of which I'll take you through, uh, that are linked by settlement to some underlying index like LIBOR or gold settlement or whatever. And you can't contract for delivery of, let's say, a million barrels of oil if it needs to be the case that someone sh sends a ship with a million barrels of oil to your home. That's rather awkward. So what you contract for is the price that you promise to pay relative to the price at which oil eventually settles according to the benchmark. Take that difference, multiply by the number of barrels, that's what you pay and, uh, or receive. And that's much more convenient, obviously, than getting a million barrels of oil sent to your house or your firm. So for hedging purposes or speculative purposes, uh, you really want to be able to write contracts that are linked to these indices. And there are other reasons as well that you want to have contractability for price contingent claims. That one's kind of obvious. Second one is maybe not quite as obvious. Paul, you can be my, um, my broker. You've arranged to buy for me uh, a billion because I'm a large company, a U.S. company. I want to buy euros to pay for my uh, services or products that I buy from Europe, and I'd like you to buy me a billion euros uh, today. If I'm able to monitor your execution quality by comparing the price that I paid uh, that you arranged for me versus the price that's announced at 4 o'clock in London, I can look at the difference and I can say, Paul, thank you. You got me exactly the London closing price. Couldn't have done better. No slippage in execution. Or I might say, Paul, I'm really disappointed that I paid 0.1 cents per euro more than the 4 o'clock price, which is called the WM Reuters fixing. So unless you can do a better job, I'm not going to hire your, uh, you as a bank, as my agent anymore. So my ability to monitor the um, execution of my agents in the market by comparing with benchmarks is very important. That's a very common application of benchmarks. By the way, it's not well modeled. This is one of the research issues that could be modeled that doesn't exist in the research literature. The last one, which I'll perhaps get to if we have enough time, is called pre-trade price transparency. So here I am. I'm a buy side firm, maybe uh, a hedge fund, and I want to um, buy, let's say, gold, and I want to comparison shop. So I asked Paul, what, what would you, what was your bid and ask for gold right now? And I'd ask Agostina, what's your bid and ask? And I'd ask Andrea, and I'd say, okay, well, um, these prices look pretty close to that benchmark that I can see in the market. Therefore, I think I've searched enough. And I'm not going to go search and ask everybody in the room. I think these guys are pretty close to the price I could probably get because I know the benchmark. These guys know when they quote to me that I can see the benchmark that's posted on the writer's screen. Therefore, they say to themselves, ah, if I don't give Daryl a price reasonably close to that benchmark, he'll know that I'm way off the market 
and he'll go get somebody else uh, to offer a price. Being aware of that, this is an, a Nash equilibrium issue, you guys are all going to give me competitive or more competitive quotes by virtue of having the benchmark available to me than you would if you knew that I had no idea what the going price is within a dollar a barrel or whatever the product is. So that one is a subject of research by myself, Hao Xiangju, and Piotr Dvorak. And if time permitting, I'll give you a feeling for how that can be modeled. So that research is in progress. As I mentioned, number two has not been researched. Number one is just sort of obvious. I don't think it needs a model. <clears throat> just to give you an idea of how significant the reliance on LIBOR, which is the focus of most of my comments, um, and Euribor, which is the Euro Eurozone's uh, Euro interbank offered rate, these are the quantities in billions of US dollars of products that settle based on LIBOR. So everybody knows that there's an enormous number of interest rate swaps that are fixed versus LIBOR. But a lot of people might not know that syndicated loans is a $3.4 trillion market. And this is not one of those things where there's an enormous canceling of longs and shorts and it's really not that big. This is big. This is a very large number. In fact, we collected that number on our market participants group. That was not an easy number to get. Bilateral corporate loans, these are floating rate notes that settle on LIBOR, 1.6 trillion. Retail mortgages. Now, only 15% of US retail mortgages are linked to LIBOR, but 15% of $10 trillion is a lot of money that depends on getting LIBOR right. And that's probably where some of the litigation damages are going to come in, is in these areas here. Uh, other floating rate notes and exchange traded derivatives, 32, 33 trillion US notional. And then over in Europe, even more swaps and a very significant number of these other products. That's only two of the currencies that we were asked to look at. The other ones, the Swiss franc, the Japanese yen, and the British pound all have very large amounts of financial products. Not this large, but very large amounts that are linked to interbank offered rates in those countries. By the way, if you have an urgent question, please ask. I'm going to try to leave plenty of time, better watch the time, plenty of time for questions at the end. But if you urgently want to ask something right now, let me know. Agostino, could you give me a, uh, just a quick readout on what time? Um, Until uh, 5.20. And then, uh, then I'm going to stop. I'm going to 5.20? 5.25 for prepared remarks or for everything? No, just for the talk. And then we will have Good. OK, so I'm going to end, uh, aim to end by 5.20, which is less than half an hour from now. Not keep you all waiting, because I already know what I'm going to say. I don't, want, I don't know what you want to ask, which is more interesting to me. One, one point, based on this figure, basically, it seems that the most of the interbank exposure is through derivatives and very little through interbank in Do I read it correctly? So, well, as I mentioned, there's an enormous amount of cancellation that goes on in these derivatives categories. So we don't really know how much of this is actual. If you go to LCH, which is a good way to check, and look at the amount of that's in initial margins at LCH, it's about 300 billion. And that gives you a kind of order of magnitude. There's a $300 billion exposure net multiplied by you know, some, some factor relates interest rate risk to initial margins. So it's still a big number. These other numbers are, there's no netting going on. These are on the balance sheet of either banks or investors that bought them and put them into CLOs, collateralized loan obligations. This, by the way, my emphasis in my remarks today is not about counterparty risk. It's all about market liquidity and you know, generally market efficiency and potentially instability. Why instability? Where does financial instability come into this? Well, suppose that Somewhere down the road, we thought we had cured this manipulation problem, this illegal reporting problem. Uh, but then it was revealed that we hadn't, and that you know, regulators weren't able to stamp out these bad, bad actions. If that were the case, and given all the fines that banks have paid and would be liable to pay, they would pull out of the proposition of reporting into LIBOR. And they would say as far from it as they could. And regulators would have to turn, twist arms very hard to get them to continue to report. This is not just hypothetical. The number of banks in Europe that was reporting for Euribor immediately after the scandal went from 50, where it had been holding, or 50-ish, immediately down to 30. And it would have gone essentially to zero had the European Central Bank not called the banks and say, don't you dare, or please do not 
uh, stop reporting because if this number disappears, there's 138 trillion of swaps that can't settle. That's a financial stability concern. Or, and this is a slightly less catastrophic but equally bad for the economy, if swap users say, oh, someday this Uribor is not going to be there because it's too prone to manipulation, the regulators are going to go after it or the banks are going to pull out, we just don't want to use this benchmark for trading anymore. So we're not going to do the hedging or speculating or market making that we had been doing out of fear that this is not a reliable benchmark. That's going to dramatically, that if it happened, would dramatically reduce the efficiency of markets because these markets are very valuable. Okay, let's talk about how LIBOR is determined. And this is still the way it's determined today, although there's some extra controls and information going into it. But basically, the three of us, banks one, two, and three, uh, might be lending money to each other. If we are, we can say, well, I'm lending money to Paul at 1.1% over six months. Um, maybe I have a little bit more information. I'm going to report a number to a benchmark administrator, which used to be the British Bankers Association. Now it's ICE, the, um, a, a, an affiliate, ICE Benchmark Ad Administrators of the ICE exchange firm. Uh, I'm going to report that number to the benchmark administrator. Likewise, Paul is going to report, Agostino is going to report. The benchmark administrator will take these reports and using some very simple algorithm will report a kind of average number which is what the interbank borrowing rate is today. Now, how do they do the averaging? Well, they throw out the top few, they throw out the bottom few, it's like diving scores, and they average the rest. It's very simple. Where do my reports come from? They come from my judgment, informed by transactions. That's always been the case, but now it's a requirement that I use all the available transactions. So it's a requirement since uh, the rules changed. This is regulated by the United Kingdom now and they must meet certain standards. Uh, they must uh, provide uh, a sort of records that the benchmark administrator can check on the actual transaction. So it's auditable, it's, there's compliance around it, it's a much more secure kind of process. However, as you will see in a moment, it is still not a reliable fixing for in many situations. You might be surprised by that. The reason is, these interbank loan markets are extremely thin. So even though the three of us are now going to rely more heavily on actual transactions and not just our opinions informed by, by requests from the swaps desk to, to move our opinions, even though we're going to rely very heavily on transactions in an audited way, there just aren't that many transactions in many cases. And that's where the problem lies. Now I want you to think about when I just said there aren't many transactions in, in this underlying market, think about the amount of instruments, particularly in the swaps market, that are resting through their settlement formulas on that very thin underlying market. And when I spoke about this recently at The Hague, where there was this law and economics meeting of minds on these issues, I used the metaphor of an elephant walking on a plank. So the elephant is this market, the rates trading market, and the plank is this very thin underlying interbank loan market. We're going to see shortly how to thicken up this plank, but even if you make this plank twice as thick, it's still tiny in comparison with this elephant. So we've got to get this elephant off of the plank. That's the objective in phase two of this project, which is ongoing in London and New York and Zurich and other places. There are other ways to get some data. We don't have to go only to the loans we make to each other. We can go into the commercial paper or certificate of deposit market to get more data. So when I issue commercial paper, or Paul does, or Agostino does, the pricing on that commercial paper can also be used to get um, a fixing. And we can merge it in with these benchmark administrator prices. And that's also being done now. And it's still too thin a market. In Australia, they invented a trade platform in which the investor can buy commercial paper from an, essentially an anonymous issuer or a package of issuers. So because the large four Australian banks are so homogeneous, as an investor you might say, I'm not that concerned about which particular 
issuer is involved, I'm just going to pay for an anonymous piece of commercial paper. And that was working reasonably well, but then it stopped working reasonably well, and they're looking for a new solution there. And that's kind of an interesting and longer story, but I want to continue with the main story. We can also go into the secondary market where commercial paper is traded. And all of these markets now where unsecured bank borrowing at terms similar to three-month LIBOR or six-month LIBOR terms, all those data are being collected and used systematically, and it's still a thin plank relative to the elephant. This is an idea that was tried in Mexico where we asked the banks essentially to make markets in their own commercial paper. Now this is not exactly what's being done in Mexico, but imagine the following requirement. I at Bank X will be required on a daily basis to make a two-sided market in my own commercial paper, meaning I will post a bid and an offer for the prices of my commercial paper. And of course, if my bid offer spread is very wide, I won't be meeting my requirements. If it's very narrow, then it better be accurate because otherwise, I'm going to get taken advantage of by investors. So I, by making a market, you can get a more, more accurate um, measure of my credit quality, and the incentives are very well aligned uh, to get that accurate. That's not being used anywhere. I think basically it's viewed as a very heavy-handed, onerous requirement on the banks uh, to be in a position to do this, and they're not being asked to do it. And there's some operational issues as well. Now, for those of you in the back of the room, at least, if not the front of the room, it doesn't seem to matter much when you look at interest rates and how they move across time, what interest rate you use, whether it's three-month LIBOR, Fed funds, which is an overnight rate, or three-month AA non-commercial, non-financial uh, commercial paper, for broad purposes of, let's say, hedging or speculating on the general movement of interest rates, you guys shouldn't really care. There's not that much difference in these lines, or if you do it by correlation, they're like 99 point something percent correlated. So what the heck, who cares about LIBOR? Why don't we just take an average of a whole lot of rates, short term, and leave it at that? Well, that would be good for many rates trading applications where speculators just want to speculate or hedge on where will interest rates be five years from now. Any of these numbers would be fine. But if you move way in close, so now you're in the front row and you're looking at movements over the very short term, look at the difference between US Treasury three-month rates and Euro dollar, which is the same as three-month LIBOR. Those movements, especially during periods of stress, like in 1974 and during the great financial crisis, those, the differences between those two quote-unquote similar rates can actually grow to about 400 basis points, which is an enormous amount if you're concerned about getting the right short-term rate. That is a huge difference. And it matters for some applications like hedging uh, bank revenues, which I'll explain in a minute. Even if you go to two different risk-free, quote-unquote risk-free rates, like the Treasury bill rate less the OIS rate, which I'll explain in a minute if you don't already know, that difference could still be quite volatile and get quite large in magnitude for some of the applications. And when our market participants group surveyed users in the financial marketplace all over the world, how about using treasury bill rates because they're very robust to manipulation, they're liquid, how about that? Almost everybody in the market, including the banks and the users of bank products said, no, we do not want treasury bill rates, they're not good for our applications because they reflect a lot of special um, aspects of treasuries and the rates on treasuries that are not common to many other markets. Even the OIS market, which is very close to a pure risk-free rate. In fact, I would argue that the OIS rate in many currencies is actually closer to the pure risk-free rate than the treasury bill rate, which might shock some of you that don't look at interest rates. Now, uh, philosophically, here's, the, here's our conundrum. So after having seen those charts of numbers, now think very conceptually. Suppose I had to pick two reference rates, and I have two dimensions in which to put them. How risky is the set of underlying issuers, and at what maturity should I go? And suppose that I had plentiful data at low credit risk and these two maturity dates. These arrows represent the location of the main speculation or hedging motive. So this person at the end of this arrow had his or her way. This is exactly the benchmark that they would like. This much credit risk, this much maturity. 
and this person wants to uh, sell. This person who wants to buy would have chosen this maturity and this much credit risk. So if you think about the trading interests, the underlying desires of investors to either buy or sell based on an interest rate, this wouldn't be their first choice. But it might serve some of their needs. The difference is called basis risk. So investors don't get exactly the product they want. They get something that's correlated with it. The difference is called basis risk. So these investors on this page are not that well served by the basis risk in this picture. If we went to these three different financial indices with, let's say, more credit risk and closer, closer to their maturity interests, they might say, yeah, that's good for me. Those are the ones that I like because the basis risk is quite small. The problem, of course, is this might not be where the most robust manipulation-free liquid in information is available. It could be that it's here. Or we might get lucky and it might well be here. And there's things pushing two different ways. One is manipulability and the other is trading interests. Um, I'm going to be cautious of time and I think I'm going to skip over. Maybe, maybe I'll just spend one minute. Think of yourself now in terms of your trading interests as a bank. You are a lender. You're a commercial bank. You make loans that are linked to a floating rate interest, like three-month LIBOR. So every three months, you're going to collect revenue from your loan book based on interest payments from the borrowers to you, the bank, that are fluctuating with LIBOR. And you are saying to yourself, this is good because when someone pays me on my revenue side, uh, LIBOR plus a fixed spread over LIBOR, and then I go out into the bank and borrow money, I'm going to be paying a borrowing rate that's by definition LIBOR. That's what LIBOR is. It's my borrowing cost. So if I take my revenues minus my borrowing costs, I have a nice, relatively stable net revenues on my loan book. And I as a bank like that, and you as borrowers could say, well, that's probably good for me too because if Duffy's bank has low risk in his loan book revenues, he won't demand a big risk premium and extra high borrowing charges. Um, competition between banks will keep these gross margins down to size. If on the other hand, I had very volatile uh, basis risk, meaning my gross margins were popping all over the place because some regulator told me I can't use LIBOR, I have to use the treasury rate, then I might charge you on average a higher borrowing cost. My gross margins would be higher on average but more volatile. You wouldn't like that. So you want it, and many of the people on our committee said, don't force the banks to use something they don't want to use because if it's causing them a lot of risk, they're going to charge us the borrowers for bearing that risk because they're going to pass on their costs. Here's the proposal that we came out with from, from our committee and then another committee that was chaired by Jeremy Stein when he was the governor of the Federal Reserve, a governor of the Federal Reserve System, took our recommendations, which turned out to be the same as their recommendations in essence, and here they are. And there's only two really that matter. First of all, these interbank offered rates like LIBOR and URIBOR need to be reformed. We need to get fixings for them that are based on a broader set of wholesale unsecured borrowings like commercial paper, certificates of deposits, and so on. We also need to get, this is a statistics problem by the way, we need to get more lag days of data because if we rely on the data for only one day, we've got few observations, it's going to be a volatile number. So both from the viewpoint of low noise and from the viewpoint of low manipulability, you don't want to have just very few observations where somebody, some bad person, could say, oh, they're only getting three or four observations a day. If I just make one more trade way off the market, I can move the benchmark 20 basis points. Even though I'll lose money on that transaction, I have a giant swap position, and it's going to make me a lot more money back uh, from, uh, from the new settlement of LIBOR. We also recommended that we don't change the legal documents defining the loans or the swaps. That is, we don't try to say there was old LIBOR, now with the benefit of all this improved statistics and data, we're going to have new LIBOR, so please rewrite all your contracts starting January 1, 2018. No. We said 
that's going to be very disruptive. Some people won't want to do it. There's a lot of operational costs. Nobody in our committee really wanted to do that. So we asked a bunch of lawyers. We had good lawyers on our committee. We said, how close does this need to be with all of these changes so that we don't need to rewrite the contract? We can just say, uh, it's still LIBOR. We have a different method for fixing it, but your contracts still apply. And the lawyers said, as long as it's done in good faith to try to get a good estimate of what the interbank offered rate would be and it doesn't differ by a whole lot, you'll be legally in a pretty safe position. And by the way, the United States is the test case because if anybody likes to sue you, it's going to happen in the United States. Uh, this still has to be tested. And I'm going to give you some reasons to be slightly concerned if we try to push this too far. I'm going to show you some numbers in a few minutes that might say, well, OK, this seamless transition will probably work for some LIBORs, like three-month US dollar LIBOR. It might not work for three-month Swiss franc LIBOR or for six-month US dollar LIBOR. Um, the second major class of recommendations that we made was a whole lot of this trading Let's go back to my basis risk problem. A whole lot of this trading wasn't about everybody wants LIBOR. A whole lot of the rates trading business, especially swaps and, and futures, is really, well, where's my other picture? A lot of this business is just rates trading. Anything that looks in this general ballpark would be good enough. And for that business, we had a proposal to pick. As long as it's for most of the derivatives, you don't need bank, LIBOR, any robust rate that moves with general market interest rates would be good. We proposed very uh, a small list by currency of alternative reference rates. Treasury bills we put on the list because it's an option, but nobody really liked it on our committee. Overnight index swaps, I've already mentioned. I'm going to show you more specifically what they are. And then a new idea that we came up with that I think is actually the best one of all, which no one has ever tried, but which I think will actually be quite, will be quite um, satisfactory and non-manipulable. Uh, this is just going to, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but this will just give you an idea of even when you include all the transactions, the number of available transactions is quite small. So if you look at the number of trades, now let's take US six-month LIBOR, the daily average number of underlying transactions is on the order of 15 to 20. The worst days, uh-oh, there's some days on which there's almost none. That tells you almost immediately that you're going to have to include some lag days of transactions so you have multiple days to look at. I'll show you the effect of that later. Volumes are over on the right. Since you can't read those numbers that well, this will help. So if you take the numbers on the page that I gave you earlier, in fact, we, in a paper that I wrote with uh, David Skye and James Vickery, we, did, we used slight, uh, somewhat different data. We went directly to the Fed and calculated inferred interbank data. This will give you an idea of how the volatility of the fixing based on the number of transactions varies as you vary the number of days in your fixing window and what maturity you're looking at. So if you, we normalize this to one, because we don't know the volatility of one observation, but based on the number of observations and some statistical methods, which are not that shocking, you can show, for example, that if you were to go from 10 days in your lagged fixing window to get an, enough numbers down to two days, which was to some of the people in our committee already kind of stale, if you did that transition, you'd increase your volatility by 68%. If you were willing to go back to 20 days, you could decrease it by 24%, down to 76% of this normal number. At other maturities, things get better or worse. That gives you a kind of an idea. This is an interesting issue, statistical problem. We'll come back a little bit to it later. If we use our approach of including other transactions, Let's take, uh, this is three-month LIBOR, and I'm sorry again if you can't see it. There's actually a lot of pixelation on the screen as well. But during the period from 2011 to 2013, three-month actual reported LIBOR is the big thick black line. The gray line above it shows significantly higher 
Uh, sorry, other way around. Actual three month LIBOR is the reported, was the gray line. The big black line is what LIBOR would have been if we relied on the transactions data that we had with some lagging in the windows. So you can see that even with lagging, it's more volatile. Here's why it's more volatile. If I ask Paul to report every day, what do you think three month LIBOR is today? And Paul doesn't have any transactions, he's probably going to give a number that was a lot like yesterday. So low transactions frequency plus opinion making is going to be like Kalman filtering or Kalman smoothing actually. And you're going to get smoothed. Actual transactions gives you a wigglier line. That's an issue because some of the applications are options. So let's keep that in mind. The other thing that you'll notice is that the actual LIBOR number, pardon me, the, uh, yes, the actual LIBOR number was substantially higher than the transactions-based LIBOR number during this period. Now, anybody wants to, you can speculate why that quite large bias might have occurred. It's even larger at six months during this particular timing window. Anybody want to guess? There's something, that I'll give you a hint. This was the period of significant bank stress during the Eurozone bank crisis. I'll give you another hint. We'll keep going until you get the answer. The actual LIBOR number in the gray line is every bank reporting its opinion, every bank in the pool reporting its opinion. The black line is based on every transaction that occurred. Is anybody getting closer to a guess? Yeah? The distressed banks weren't lending. The distressed banks weren't lending. You're getting a selection bias towards the stronger banks because all the transactions that were occurring were for banks that were willing to issue or for investors that were willing to invest in their issues during this stress period. And that means better banks. So there's a selection bias in the black line. Why didn't it happen at, at one month? Probably because there was a shifting of maturities of the poorer credit quality banks saying, I'm no longer issuing at six months. I, can only seem to, I only seem to be able to fund myself at one month, uh, economically speaking. So that's kind of an interesting story. Now we're going to go into the OIS market. How many people have heard of OIS before? Stick up your hands. About half the group. So it's worth explaining what it is. So uh, Andrea, you're my interest rate swap counterparty, but we're not going to do a typical three-month LIBOR versus fixed. We're going to do a 90-day swap, and here's the exchange. I will commit to pay you a fixed interest rate based on a notional of 100 or 1 at the end of 90 days. So that's a fixed rate. You will agree to pay me the green bar, which is the interest rate that you get when compounding the daily interest rate between now and 90 days from now. So looking forward, we don't know what this, how big this green bar is going to be because we don't know what the daily interest rates will be. This is called an OIS swap or overnight index swap. And this rate is called the 90-day OIS rate. One of the proposals on our committee was to use the 90-day OIS rate as a new benchmark alternative to LIBOR, okay, and there were some pros and cons in that. The biggest con, and that's not meant as a, as a, uh, as a, as a pun, the biggest disadvantage is that this is a thin market today. It's getting thicker. It's pretty thick in terms of the amount of money that you and I handle on a given day. It's in the billions of dollars a day, but it's not r really thick. Okay, so that's, that was one of the list numbers on the list that you saw a few minutes ago for alternative rates is this number here, the fixed rate. Anybody want to guess my favorite choice from this picture? There's an implicit rate in this picture that could serve as a benchmark. You have to kind of turn yourself upside down and inside out to come up with a proposal for what will be the 90-day interest rate on your home mortgage payment three months from now. And you'll pay it every three months after that for the next 30 years. So what would that interest rate be if you only had, if you rule out this fixed 90-day rate, the only other alternative, since nobody has stuck up their hand, is to take the implied 90-day rate that comes from compounding the overnight rates. So that's going to end up being a number. You know, it might be like 1.23%. By the time 90 days is up, 
We'll know what that number is, 1.23%. We'll look at your mortgage principal. We'll charge you 1.23% of that principal on a quarterly basis. You'll pay it. Then three months later, we'll look at the compounding up of the overnight rate for the next three months. It'll be 1.38%. You'll pay that much on your mortgage. Or if you're a corporate borrower, your floating rate note will cause you to pay that much. Now, uh, when I and a few others in my committee proposed this, some of the people on the committee said, oh my gosh, that is so unusual because we won't know what our interest rate payments are until 90 days are up. Of course, Andrea, my swap counterparty, he wouldn't know either on his swap payment what interest rate he's going to have to pay. And this is not, in my view, an operational impediment to this working. And if you, as far as mortgage uh, payers go, probably most people wouldn't notice if it said in the fine print, we're going to use the implied rate from the green bar, and every month that money will come out of your bank account. Because that's pretty much what happens now. Nobody's actually looking uh, to see exactly how they calculate three-month LIBOR uh, when they pay their mortgage payment. And this wouldn't be an operational problem for the corporate loan market either. Certainly wouldn't be a, prop a problem for the swap market because those guys are all big you know, dealers and professional hedge funds and in the wholesale financial markets making swap payments have quarterly coupons based on this green bar. It's not going to be a problem. It's just not going to be a problem. And some of them and many of them would say, well, never mind making quarterly payments based on the green bar. If I want a 10-year swap, I'll just move this whole maturity out to the end of 10 years. And those swaps exist. They're traded. I'm not sure that they'd be as popular as my first choice. And I'm pretty confident that my choice wouldn't, uh, would be a lot better for floating rate notes and things like that, where you need a floating rate coupon every three months. This rate is completely non-manipulable. Why? Because the overnight rates that go into these are things like central bank swap rates, uh, pardon me, central bank official rates, like Fed funds, which are fixed by central banks or extremely uh, hard to manipulate overnight repo rates and things like that. They're very, very solid, robust overnight rates. So determining R1 or R2 or R3 is not going to be a problem of manipulation, except in maybe very small currencies. And compounding up, well, there's no manipulation in compounding. That's just a mathematical formula. Anybody can put it on their spreadsheet, and there won't be any disagreement about what happens when you compound these numbers. So this is not a manipulable rate for practical purposes. And it serves the rates trading world very well. But that doesn't mean the problem is solved, because how are you going to get people that are trading three-month LIBOR to start trading this rate? I have benchmark A, it's very popular. I put up benchmark B and say, fantastic rate, just as good for your application, maybe better. And you say, well, you know what? There's only a couple guys trading that rate. There's a lot of liquidity over here in three month LIBOR. I think you should talk everybody else into the room, in the room, into moving over to the new benchmark. And I'll just continue trading the old one until you get a lot of liquidity in the new one. Obvious problem here uh, is that you, you have a chicken and egg which comes first? Who's going to move if nobody's moved? Big problem. That is the problem today. So right now in London, New York, Zurich, regulators and banks are thinking about how are we going to move the market from LIBOR or URIBOR over to something like an OIS rate based on some choice, which is also subject to design for the overnight interest rate. And there are choices to be made in both in the United States and right now in the United Kingdom and in the Eurozone for exactly how to fix this number. Because there, there's not so much an issue of manipulability, but there is an issue of basis risk on that number, design of that number. Of course, even if B is a lot better for most people, you still have the same problem. If everybody is trading A, they'd all like to trade B. Who's going to move first? Nobody until the liquidity in B is improved enough. Because liquidity is extremely important in the financial system. The basis risk effect is just not enough domination in that case. There are other alternatives for those of you who have taken financial engineering. If this is the rate you want to fix, in many cases in finance, you can construct it synthetically with two different financial instruments. The obvious case is covered interest parity. Do you want to get uh, a three-month Swiss franc rate? You could get the three-month dollar rate the Swiss franc dollar three-month forward rate, and home make your own synthetic 
Fremont Swiss rate. And if you think that might not be exactly right, you could do the same thing with the euro three month rate and the euro franc cross rate and the British pound one and average all three. So you have a lot to work with in this market. By the way, that's not popular in our committee. Nobody wanted it. I don't know why. Uh, you can use put call parity. So uh, I know we have some financial engineers in the room. How many have seen put call parity? Wow, lots of people. Okay, great. So put call parity says you can make uh, a call out of a put, the underlying, and a bond. You all, um, you've all seen that. Well, I'll just turn the formula backwards. You can make a bond from the underlying, a call, and a put. If you can make a bond, then you can calculate the implied bond rate. That's your three-month interest rate. There is a serious problem with that, which is that these calls and puts mature on calendar dates. So it won't be three months for very long. It'll be two months pretty soon. And then you've got to do something else. Uh, which, which is one of the reasons we rejected this. Uh, another thing to do is you want a LIBOR rate, you could get a risk-free rate and add in a, a proxy for the CDS rate. Nobody liked that one either. We actually wrote about that in our report. If anyone's interested in our report, it's voluminous, 700 pages. It's on the, available on the webpage of the Financial Stability Board. You can also get to it through my webpage. Okay, the last few minutes I want to talk about a combination of a statistical problem and a game theory problem associated with manipulation, and then we'll have Q&A. So I'm still okay, for, are we still okay for the Q&A, or am I already at the end? Uh, We're at the end, right? Maybe I won't do this because it'll take more than two or three minutes, it might come up in Q&A, and it's more than, you know, probably more than I need to cover. But th basically, there is a game theory problem between the benchmark administrator who's set, designing the benchmark fixing method and the potential manipulators in the audience that are gaming the fixing by their trading. Benchmark administrator is going to design that benchmark as resistant as possible to manipulation, subject to not too much distortion. And just to give you a hint of the answer, the solution to that in order to minimize the variance, the L2 norm of the distortion, you do not zero out manipulation. The optimal thing to do if you're only concerned with minimal distortion is to allow some degree of manipulation by overweighting large transactions and underweighting small transactions. We did not figure out how to over and underweight based on prices optimally, but clearly you want to underweight outliers and overweight uh, price observations close to the median, but that is a much harder mathematical problem. There's another challenge for you researchers in the audience. Remember though, it's not just statistics, it's statistics plus game theory. Because if you move your design, the manipulators will move their strategies accordingly. And okay, so that's the gist of that. Thank you. Thank you.